Uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, Division One, and we have our special guest, Division Three, uh, at our Toolbox Talk series. Uh, this is a, a monthly series, uh, almost monthly series we do um, on the fourth Thursday of the month at 12 uh, Eastern. Uh, we're going to be publishing our whole calendar year 2022 uh, Toolbox Talk series soon, so be on the lookout for that. Um, our next meeting uh, is actually not going to be until it's not going to be until March um, because we're going to be in San Diego for the midwinter meeting uh, uh, next uh, month. Um, today we have a, a great topic. It's on delegated design. Um, we have um, the uh, chair of uh, Division Three uh, Design uh, joining us, Joel Jeffka Jeffko. Uh, Joel is the regional general counsel for the global design firm Perkins and Will. She's based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, she's an architect and an attorney with over a decade of experience um, as a project architect and project manager. Um, and as I said, she is the chair of Division Three. Uh, Saqib Khan um, is uh, our Division I representative. Um, he founded uh, Khan Law, P PLCC, uh, a Massachusetts boutique construction law firm, primarily representing ge general contractors and subs in public and private markets in New England. Um, Saqib and Joel, uh, take it away. I know you have this PowerPoint. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, uh, Delegated design is something that uh, I think Joel and I and several of us are seeing more and more of in our uh, practices. Um, and uh, before we begin kind of a, a larger group discussion, uh, do want to take a few minutes to frame um, delegated design, what it is, um, kind of how you see it when you encounter it, and then we can get into some of the themes that come up when, when litigating and trying to resolve disputes related to and arising out of delegated design. Um, so what do we mean when we say delegated design? Um, well, the AIA, uh, you know, and, and the consensus docs um, both contemplate that um, even in a design bid build uh, project delivery scenario, there may still be, um, and frequently are, um, elements of the project's design that are not fully designed at the time the contractor is brought on board either you know in a public market scenario bid or or contracted and procured in a private market scenario um and so they uh you know contemplate this and they, they have some uh provisions in their standard form contracts uh to parcel out design so when we mean delegated design we mean that um the specifications for the project um, not only include prescriptive specifications and i'm reading from aia commentary but also performance specifications um, that provide for the design and performance criteria for certain building systems. So what we're talking about here is a hybridization of performance and design specifications, um, even in a design bid build scenario. And it, it's becoming more common. And there are many examples of types of building elements where you see um, specifications that don't provide a complete design. So some common examples of the types of building elements where you commonly see Delegated design would be sprinkler system routing. Generally, mechanical systems have quite a bit of it. Sprinkler system routing, the control systems for HVAC and building management systems, um, the fire protection systems, both alarm and, uh, as, as you said, sprinkler, as well as security systems are, are frequently ones that are um, designed uh, by specialty subcontractors contracted through the prime contractor. Um, structural elements uh, also have a fair amount of detailing um, that is done uh, by registered engineers that are consultants then to the specialty subs that are performing the work. Um, you see that in steel connection work, um, precast uh, or pre-stressed concrete, manufactured wood trusses. You see this with miscellaneous metals as well as building envelope systems um, that can include uh, not only curtain wall systems engineer, and pre-engineered wall systems, but also, uh, I think as Joel might uh, talk about a little later, um, even you know other elements of the building element like like doors, um, and then specialty items. You see it quite a bit with elevators, certain types of stadium equipments, whether it's stadium lights or bleachers and whatnot. Um, a lot of that can be um, things where the designer um, doesn't, when pr producing the design to be the basis of the prime contract doesn't 
do the same level of detail, specificity, and uh, prescription that you see um, with most building elements. Um, so how can you tell if a specification that you're, that you're looking at um, in the field calls for delegated design? Well, um, you know, the easy ones are where it specifically requires the contractor to make a submittal by a licensed design professional. So if you've got your um, general contractor and then you know, the contract specifically requires general contractor has to go hire a designer, well then some amount of the design has likely been delegated. Um, and then uh, the, the other question to ask, and this is one I ask of my clients um, all the time is, is there sufficient information in the plans and specifications for a contractor to be able to perform takeoff and quantity for specific materials shown? So a lot of times where you're seeing design being delegated, um, the pricing elements that a contractor usually looks for when pricing a uh, prescriptive design are, are missing. Um, and instead of being able to measure um, how many linear feet of sprinkler run are you gonna have in this building, the contractor has to first start with, well, how many square feet of building is there and how many you know, sprinkler heads are we gonna put in? How are we gonna run our pipes? And they're, they're figuring that out when they are building their bid. Um, the more difficult uh, areas where you have to determine in determining whether a specification calls for delegated design or or not are situations where the details where details not necessarily um, the entire uh, quantities that you would use at bid time, but details are to be inferred by the contractor. And uh, a good reference there is to the general conditions as to whether they warrant uh, complete and sufficient. Uh, plans and specifications for the contract documents, or whether they simply they, they say the contractor must reasonably infer from the information provided additional details. Um, and uh, sometimes I'm, we're, I think we're starting to see some more of this. I certainly am. Um, in specifications that both have performance requirements and certain design specifications or prescriptions, or even performance requirements combined with some element of proprietary specifications. So the specification may say, and we'll see an example of this, um, both a performance requirement and a specified manufacturer. Um, Joelle. Yeah, so thank you, Stockham. Um, so the designer is gonna have some interest in making sure that there's elements of design that are delegated that are covered in the specs and drawings. Um, so from a designer's perspective, you know, the question is, have, have I provided sufficient information for a reasonable contractor or their sub to be able to deliver what the project requires? So is there, you know, a, enough information both combined in the drawing specs that call out that, per, that performance criteria that needs to be met and that it provides enough context for the contractor to be able to make their own conclusions about what's necessary to achieve the aesthetic requirements of the project, the performance criteria otherwise that need to be engineered. Um, what is the contractual effect of my shop drawing and submittal review? So if I'm going to be uh, receiving submittals that are coming in from a subcontractor who is the delegated design engineer, for example, taking responsibility for and sealing the documents that are being submitted, what does my contract say about how much review I need to put in over that work that's being submitted? Do I have a right to rely on that sealed um, design of the sub or has my contract obligated me to do some enhanced level of review of that submittal? And then also, can I reasonably, you know, do I have to perform my own investigation? It gets to the same point I just made or do I, you know, need to get independent testing done? Um, can I rely on that engineer's work as being standalone? Um, you know, engineered work that um, interfaces and I can rely that it interfaces with the work. I think usually the answer to that is there is an amount of work that an engineer, the design engineer needs to have in order to confirm that what has been submitted does work with the overall system. So for example, if I'm a structural engineer and I've delegated design of trusses, I need to know that the, the way that those trusses sit on my other structural steel that I've designed works, that those connections are there, that the load requirements are met, that the overall seismic design is being accomplished through the delivery of, you know, and the interface with those trusses. Um, so there is still some work that needs to be done to coordinate and to, in, to do an amount of um, review of the delegated design submittal. 
you can hit the next slide. Yeah. So um, from the contractor's uh, side of things, the concerns that uh, my clients see often or that I have for them um, when they're facing delegated design is, do I have sufficient information to price the system at the time of contract formation? Um, you know, and, and so when you have a delegated design uh, specification in a lump sum type contract, uh, often uh, the question the contractor is asking subsequent to that, if they don't have enough information, is do I have to make assumptions that may give rise to increased costs if the assumptions are later proven to be false? Um, so that, that's, that's the first concern is just how do you price this when you don't necessarily know what it is, what might be acceptable, um, and, and what do you do when you made the assumption in your pricing that is later proven false during the project? Um, then is there a ready set of subcontractors that can provide this element on a turnkey basis, or do I have to assemble a team to deliver this on my own? So can I go to a, a precast concrete sub um, and get this precast concrete element designed in a turnkey basis? The sub already has their own structural engineer that either is in-house or they use all the time, um, and they can deliver this to me turnkey, or am I, the general contractor, having to go both find first a designer to assemble a design, and then separately go find a a subcontractor to execute. Um, and then if there isn't a turnkey product available, what have I gotten myself into if I've gotten into this job and I am trying to make that kind of marriage? Um, why was this element of the design delegated not designed by the design team like the rest of the project? I frequently hear contractors very concerned about that. Um, not so much before entering into the contract, but very much at the precipice of a dispute. Um, so owners have concerns too. I mean, it, it is in the interest of the owner to make sure they've got their bases covered, right? Um, an owner can assume that I'm hiring a design team to design this project. So why would there be things that aren't designed by the design team? Well, it's a valid question, but there's a good answer for it. Um, this element or system that's being delegated may very well normally be delegated and not be something that you wanna pay your specialized design team to design. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, um, sprinkler piping, it's not an efficient use of the mechanical electrical plumbing engineer's time necessarily in every case to actually lay out the sprinkler piping runs. It is much more efficient to have the sprinkler sub do that work. The engineer will provide the performance criteria, maybe the head layout, the things that aesthetically matter to the design team, provide the plumbing riser diagrams and such that support the um, distribution of the sprinkler piping. But the piping itself, is usually something that's part of the uh, means and methods of the contractor to work out in terms of overall coordination of above ceiling conditions. So normally that is something that's delegated. Um, on the other hand, something like a curtain wall system needs to be delegated because whether, no matter what manufacturer you're going to use to provide curtain wall, they're all going to have their own unique structural shapes and things that work with their system. So if you wanna have your design professional team responsible for designing something like a curtain wall, as an owner, you're going to be pigeonholing pigeon <laughs> your design into one manufacturer. And that's not what you want as an owner that wants to have a competitive bid process. So, um, and there's also efficiencies to be gained by having a product manufacturer's own engineers design their own systems that they manufacture and that they have tested and they understand and use. It's going to be a lot less expensive in the long run to have those engineers who are specialized to that system design that versus your structural engineer who is gonna to have to become familiar with that system, do all the research and come up with um, a, a working understanding of how that system works. So you could be very much inadvertently limiting your ability for the contractor to provide competitive pricing if you don't allow design delegation on your project, or you think that you wanna instead craft your contract to say that the architect shall not delegate anything to the contractors. I've seen that lately coming up. Um, and it, it always is a point of education for me to our clients. Um, a good example is miscellaneous metals and you know, bar joists and, and you know, Sockett went through a very good list. There's a lot more that can be piled onto that that are things that are delegated um, window and door systems, things that are, you know, the actual engineering and the mechanics of how those things work are, are not things that you want to be paying your, your design team to design and also inadvertently, you know, causing it to be a 
such a narrowly tailored, narrowly tailored criteria that you can't now have competition on your project. Um, and then the last point that I think an owner needs to be considering is um, the difference between warranty claims and professional negligence claims that can arise when something is delegated. So you, usually owners are pretty familiar with, um, you know, if there's a claim against a design professional, it's couched in professional liability, right? It's, it's gonna be framed up as a professional negligence claim. On the other hand, if there's a delegated design element that um, has, has an issue with it, an owner needs to be considering, is this a warranty item that I can just go to my contractor and invoke a one-year warranty claim on, or do I need to structure my claim as a professional negligence claim. There's time limitations around that and it's something that the owner needs to think about. Do I, should I be requiring my um, general contractor to have professional liability insurance to cover delegated design items? The answer to that's probably yes. Um, but it's something that needs to be thought about if I'm an owner. Certainly, so looking at some examples now, um... And I think we'll look at a couple of examples of, of situations where delegated design has, has brought up issues and, and potential disputes. Um, you know, the, the first example um, is one from my experience. Uh, this is a specification, it's been chopped up a little bit, um, that starts out right from the start as requiring the contractor to design, engineer, furnish, and install terracotta panels. So that is a, a functionally a design build um, performance specification. It's got under there, and uh, I've, I've faded out the, the details, but um, a section for performance criteria. And it, this specification had a detailed, you know, several page list of performance criteria that these panels have to have to meet. And so, you know, from the face of the first front end of the specification, this would be a delegated design specification. Um, however, in, in this instance, where you got down to the manufacturer, um, you had a, a bit of a, uh, uh, a note that caused confusion, at least for some contractors involved in this particular project. Um, this one specifically, rather than allowing for competition between a whole host of potential um, providers, this one provided what the contractors interpreted to be a proprietary specification mixed in with this performance spec. It specified a manufacturer with a specific um, uh, product um, and said that to establish a level of quality and visual characteristics desired, um, these drawings and specifications are based on that particular product. So contractor took that to be a, um, a warranty of some sort that if they, if they submitted that product, um, it would, the job would essentially function like it was a, um, a, a proprietary specification and the architect would simply say, okay, well, you submitted the product that we specified, therefore rubber stamp, it's good. Um, but uh, the spec didn't necessarily read that way and that can cause a whole host of potential problems uh, where the design has both been delegated and the contractor um, feels that they may have been, when they were preparing their bid or getting into this project, led along a certain path. So a lot of the issues that we see with delegated design come out of um, perhaps the way specifications are written, written and the way um, information is communicated that results in expectations between the parties that aren't necessarily uniform. So Cop, Sakib, can I ask a question yeah. about that? Oh, one? Of course. So, okay, so if I'm, looking at this and I'm um, the contractor and I'm, I'm saying, okay, well, they've chosen Terriel North America LLC's product as the, it, it's a, a single source spec, right? They're saying they yes. want this one. How, how is that in conflict with the need for that system to then be engineered under 1.1A2 would be my question. Because I, I think that yeah. the, the system still needs to be engineered, right? Because the panels are heavy. They mm -hmm. sit on a subframe and that yep. subframe structure needs to be engineered. So the, uh, you know, the, I think what, what we as design professionals mm -hmm. from our perspective would be saying is we, we're here to say you contractor are not off, let off the hook from having to do engineering if you provide the specified manufacturer, because inherently that system requires engineering in order to be supplied, right? Because yes. Yeah, so the system may require some amount of engineering to be supplied, but um, the question then arises as to whether um, there is any sort of spearing type implied warranty as to the sufficiency of the use of the product 
hmm. in this particular instance. So in the application, if, in the application, right? And so there, you now have, um, you know, a situation where perhaps upon review of a submittal, the architect and the engineer for the project are, are looking at this and um, determining that uh, the um, in in the particular application, this product may not meet the performance criteria that are specified in 1.4. Okay, um, gotcha. So mm -hmm. you, you can develop then conflicts as to whether the specified product itself meets the application, meets the performance required criteria there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you really start to read the specified manufacturer, I don't think it necessarily says it's a sole source. It says it says the drawings and specifications are based on this mm -hmm. particular product, but it doesn't necessarily say that you that must product, provide this one. Yeah, that, that you must provide this one or that, right. that product even necessarily works in context of, of the rest of the job. Yep, I agree. And I think it's important that designers coordinate those specs when they're going to, you know, make a, a basis of design selection like that to ensure that there's an ability to meet the performance criteria that you're setting out by that basis of design product. And um, this goes back to the old adage, where's the RFI? <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yep. All right, so um, we want to talk, talk a little bit about a case study. I ran into an issue once on a project where um, our design team had specified, um, well, included in the design, a, a desire to have these kind of folding doors, right, on a project. And they were specified with performance criteria and the design was delegated because there was engineering required in these. Those are heavy systems. They um, have a support structure and each manufacturer that makes these doors has their own criteria for how those doors get manufactured and they have to be engineered. So um, it was a delegated design submittal that came in and the basis of design um, showed in you know, graphic intent of the, of the doors to fold inward when they gathered up against the wall. So you can see here two different photos of two different door systems one of them based on the number of, I guess it's the number of folds that happen. Um, the one on the left folds out and the one on the right folds in, right? So in the field, what ended up happening was um, doors got supplied and they folded out. And unfortunately there was a conflict because these doors were located on an upper level of a building that went to sort of a Juliet balcony kind of a situation. And they couldn't fold out because there was a railing on the Juliet balcony. They needed to fold in. So the question came up, you know, what went wrong? What do we do? You know, there's a problem. We've got these doors, they're on site and they can't get installed because they can't open because they have to fold out. Um, and so obviously the question there is, okay, who's, who's on first here? Um, where, who's responsible for this? And, you know, it, there isn't, there wasn't enough information or anything that said on the specs doors must fold inward. Um, but contextually, when you look at the plans, it did show the doors folding inward because there was a balcony. So then the question becomes, well, what is the responsibility of the subcontractor to, in doing their delegated design responsibilities, look at the context around these doors? Is it enough to just engineer the doors and make sure that they'll stand up and you know carry their own weight and meet ADA requirements and what have you? Um, is there an obligation to also look beyond just your product that you're engineering to understand the context? And I think the answer to that is yes. And certainly if not the sub, the general contractor has an obligation to coordinate that stuff. But what about the architect? Those shop drawings came in. What context was shown um, in terms of the documents that were submitted for those doors to be, who, whose job is it to check and catch that there's a conflict there? And that's it's a question. I don't have an answer necessarily for it. I think there's a shared responsibility in doing that because there's no clear cut answer. Um, to make matters worse, this project had an elevation issue where the floor, as I mentioned, it was leading to a balcony, but it was actually up on an upper floor where there were wind load issues that were also compounding the problem. The engineer that, delegated, that did the delegated design for whatever reason, wasn't aware of the location on the building where these doors were and did not take into account the wind load on the doors. So they weren't gonna perform regardless of the railing interference 
um, they would not meet the wind load criteria. So um, I think that is a good snapshot of an example where you know, the design team does not have the capacity to actually design and engineer the doors themselves because it's a manufactured product and requires the product manufacturer to engineer its own door system. But there is an obligation perhaps shared amongst the design team and the general contractors team to look at the overall coordination of the item to ensure that it will work in the application as it's intended. Now, is it the engineers, the design engineers responsibility to check the delegated design engineers wind load calc? I, I would argue probably not. I think that's something that you should expect that they would have noticed and, and done their due diligence on. In terms of the accordion function and the way that it fastens to the wall and the railing interaction, I, you know, I don't have a clear answer there as to whether there was some shared responsibility on that, but these are the kinds of claims that come up on these things. Um, and we thought this is a good illustration to talk about. Yeah, certainly it's, when, when you start talking about shared responsibility, that's where, um, you know, how do you approach something in litigation really becomes, right becomes critical. Um, so when we, we are, uh, you know, with division one here, as well as division three, so let's talk a little bit about how to address these in, in disputes. Um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about your discovery and your pace, your case preparation, um, going into a delegated design related dispute, um, you know, one thing I, I find really helpful is to use timelines to establish who knew what and when, um, you know, what did, for example, coming back to the doors example, um, what information did the delegated designer receive regarding context around the rest of the project and when did he or she receive it? Um, and, and perhaps also starting all the way from the design development stage um, with uh, owner designer meetings is, is somewhere that I, I like to try to start probing because that's where you can start to get into design intent and whether something was um, a product or material or assembly was uh, really the product of a designer's imagination uh, and creativity or whether it came from a, an owner directed requirement. Um, and, and from there to get into who drove the decision to design the element, to delegate the design of the element at issue. Um, and, and that's maybe not as important in uh, clear cut cases like uh, where you've got a curtain wall situation, but in some others where perhaps, um, you know, it's not as commonly delegated, uh, that question comes up. Um, and then, as Joel said, where was the RFI? Were, were there questions at bid time before um, uh, the signing of the contract? Um, did other bidders or prospective contractors, other than the one that ended up uh, winning the award, question the performance criteria or other, other elements? And then during the project, where were the RFIs? Um, did the contractor ask or assume? Um, and then what was the quality of the RFI response? Um, you know, occasionally you'll the RFIs. I've got one matter right now where the RFI response was essentially doubly regurgitated the same information that was in <laughs> in, in the uh, that, that generated the question in the first place. Um, so really focusing <laughs> discover discovery on those issues. Um, and then what was the uh, you know what has the designer specified in other instances? Um, that can be a little difficult to um, perhaps probe and document discovery in a focused way, but I, I like to ask it in depositions. Um, you know, where, where else have you used this product? Where else have you used similar products? Um, what were the applications there? And start to get into that information. Um, and then what did the contractor use to develop its pricing? Um, and if it used subcontractor pr proposals, how many? And what were the very varying criteria and critically the exclusions? Because oftentimes the specialty subs uh, can see these problems coming uh, you know, far in advance of when general contractors see them. And, Perhaps there are exclusions on some sub proposals that uh, can give you some instant, some sense of who should have known what and when because another sub bidder uh, noticed something. Um, and then, you know, themes for, for trial and arbitration um, really when in, in mediation, because I think Joel, you, you had um, mentioned it as well that a lot of this has to be worked out because there's shared responsibility. Um, the themes that, that uh, we see often are whose job, whose responsibility, whose duty was designing the system in question? Um, was the design fully delegated in the spec or not? Um, and uh, then, you know, was the contractor's submittal reasonable on its face and yet somehow fundamentally flawed? Or, um, you know, should something have been picked up in the submittal review process? Um, and then a lot of this also comes down to, and 
uh, you know, the level of focus that you're, you're putting things on um, when you're making your presentation, uh, you know, something that looks like a very obvious conflict when you're zoomed in and only spending, you know, a three day trial looking at that one particular issue and that one particular submittal and the jury sees that same submittal 15 times in, in a three day period uh, looks very obvious at that point. Um, but then contextualizing that um, in the context of your presentation as well can be helpful that, you know, this is one submittal out of thousands and really trying to zoom that out for the finder effect. So you don't become as myopically focused on the issue at hand. Questions? Oh, we are. We're right at 12.30. At 12, 12.32, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well uh, Joelle and Sakib, thank you so much for this, this topic. I, I put their email addresses in my email in if you wanted to um, ask questions uh, you know, offline. Um, uh, Dave Pont, um, why don't you ask, uh, ask one of your questions? And thank you for submitting two of them. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up after your question. So the last one. Um, what happens when, I know here in Massachusetts and uh, Sakiba, I know you're aware of this, when you deal with a filed submitter where the work is procured independently from the contract uh, and the delegated design is the responsibility of the filed submitter, where does the responsibility lay? You know, when, when you have issues like that? Well, I, I think through, um, specific nuances in the um, procurement statutes in Massachusetts, delegated design is something the statutory scheme does not really contemplate. Um, we've got specific procurement statutes here for design bid build um, projects. And there is, I think a fairly detailed level of case law that says the design needs to be um, full and complete and include all the building elements necessary for a contractor to submit their price at bid stage. Um, but that doesn't stop delegated design from being in pretty much every single specification for one of those projects out there. Um, so really, I think, I think where you're dealing with a filed submitter, um, you know, where the situation where the, the subs are bidding independently of the prime, um, I think a similar situation may be in New York with its Wix law. Um, You've got a situation where, okay, the subs then are, are submitting um, proposals to do a specific scope for a specific price. If they are the lowest responsible filed sub bidder as selected by the awarding authority, they will be selected. And then I think they have the same types of issues um, and responsibilities and duties that a prime bidder would uh, assume under the same circumstances. Great. Thank you, Sakib. And thank you, Joelle, and, and uh, everyone for attending. I hope to see uh, many of you in San Diego uh, next, um, next month. And if not, uh, Division One is having its um, lunch program on February 24th at 3 p.m. Um, uh, available via Zoom. So I'll send out the invite uh, to our regular list, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all then. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.